Okay, is that better? Have you got it up there? <clears throat> okay, well, today we're going to go through um, two examples of uh, flitch beams. Uh, one, uh, I, th I added, actually, I added this uh, this morning to the PowerPoint, which means I'll have to, I guess, re upload that, what's on the web. Um, but I thought it'd be nice to look at one that, that uh, let's see if I can work this, looks at load capacity. The other example that I did Monday as an analysis example uh, tested for whether the member passed or failed. So uh, this is also an analysis example, meaning that the, the section is given. I mean, you're given a, uh, a member. Um, but here, I want to know one thing more, rather than just whether it passes or fails, I'd like to know maybe what the ultimate load capacity actually is. So the, the load in this case would not be given. And this is, this is a, I mean, you know, you can imagine as a pretty uh, common question, if, a, if you have an existing beam, then maybe you'd like to know what the capacity is, not just whether it passes or fails. I mean, yes, passes or fail is uh, kind of interesting, but, but it might be, if it is indeed an existing beam, then maybe you'd like to know the capacity of it. So we'll go through that. And it also brings out uh, another thing that, that doesn't show up maybe in the, the first example, and that is looking at the actual strain compatibility with the strain diagram. And then after we do this, uh, we'll go through a design example. Um, so here we go. This one, this is a, another one that's set up with a piece of wood. Maybe not the most typical um, um, scenario with the, the wood uh, laminated to the top of, uh, steel, or is it steel? Yeah, steel plates laminated top and bottom. It would be a little bit more difficult to construct than if the steel were, say, bolted to the side. But this is, but also probably a more efficient use of the material because you're putting the stronger material at the extreme fibers. So this is, although it may be a little bit more difficult to construct, is probably the more uh, efficient uh, configuration for the uh, composite. So just like in the other uh, analysis example, you start by finding this, this modular ratio. In this case, we're using steel and wood, a red wood that's got uh, an E modulus of 1,000 KSI. Uh, so, and the, the steel you see is quite a bit stiffer, 29 times stiffer, 29 KSI. So the, the modular ratio or this scale factor of the stresses uh, it comes out to be 29. Now that number you want to use to um, build the transform section, right? Essentially what you're doing is, is scaling uh, the stronger material up by that, that modular ratio so that uh, it's as if you're replacing, you think of it as replacing that stronger material with more of the weaker material. That, that way, in this, this kind of uh, <laughs> transformed uh, section, the material is all the same. It's as if it's all made out of wood. Here you've got wood and steel. This would be what it would look like if you did the whole thing out of wood and it had the same stiffness. So the idea is this has exactly the same uh, stiffness as this does. But because the steel is so much stiffer than wood, then obviously it's going to take a lot more wood to produce the same effect. So that's why the, the uh, wood then gets scaled up. Now the reason for doing this, if, it, if it's all out of, of the same material, then we can use, then, then we can calculate an I because being of the same material, this, the, the strain's going to be, um, well, the strain would be, in any way, the stresses would be um, linear. And that's, that's the assumption in that equation, MC over I. So you have to do, the reason you're, oh gosh, this is a hard thing to use here. Uh, the reason you're going through all this trouble is only so that you could use MC over I. Otherwise, you don't have an I, there's no way to calculate I. You can't calculate I for this. Uh, 
you, it doesn't make any sense. There's this, the, the whole idea of that eye assumes that the, the uh, stresses, or the use of it, assumes that the stresses are, are uh, linear. So you have to have a material where, where that's going to take place. So, okay, now we can go ahead and calculate uh, the eye for this section here. And I must have done it by uh, pieces, right? I have to look at this and remember what, what the heck I'm doing here. Oh, this is this is the hundred and oh gosh, what the heck did I do? Where's this width? This is five five point five. This is three and a half. Where's the five point five? This must be the depth. Here's the five point five. This is the this is for the wood. Okay, this is three and a half by 5.5 cube over 12. So that's for that piece there. OK, then what the heck? I was trying, I, I, I didn't do, I must have done this as solids and voids, huh? Because there's no d squared term in it. This is. What the heck? This is the steel pieces? Let's see. This is the 100 and, yeah, OK. These are the steel pieces. Oh, there's the d squared term. All right. Gosh, I, I wish I would have written it out. I, I should redo that and write it out with the number, with the letters first so I could <laughs> know what I'm doing. What the heck? OK, this is, this is b d uh, cubed over 12 for this piece up here, this plate. There's the width, and there's the, the 0.25 is the thickness. OK, so that's that. This is going to be times two because there are two of them. And the, then you, you remember in the transformation equation, there's an, there's a, um, a D, an AD squared term. It's the, the I plus AD squared. So this is the I, and this is plus A. A is, that must be the area for that little strip there, times uh, D squared, which is the, from the center of that down to the neutral axis, that distance there is that number squared. So that, those are the numbers just for one plate, and there are two plates, top and bottom, so that's why it gets multiplied by two. Woo, wow, OK. So that, then, is the, the wood portion. This is the steel portion. OK, comes out like that. Add the two together, and you get, then, the sum of the two. That's, then, the total moment of inertia for that shape right there. All right, OK. So you get that far, then. What do you do? Now, now you can look at the, the uh, strains. And this is kind of, this is, I think, kind of interesting. And it, it, it uh, helps you understand a little bit of how these things behave in looking at the strains. Um, there's, for each material, for both the wood and the steel, there's some allowable strain, just like there's an allowable stress. We were given in the problem the allowable stresses. The allowable stress, this is the yield stress for the steel. OK, there's, that's the behavior of the steel up here. Well, the allowable stress is something, different, something less. Like, that must be 0.6 times 36, or about that. Uh, so that's an allowable, has a safety factor on it, <coughs> as an allowable stress for the steel. Now, at that, at that allowable stress for the steel, there's a, a uh, um, uh, a strain that goes along with that. The stress and the strain are linked by the uh, modulus of elasticity, right? As long as the material is behaving uh, elastically, it's in some uh, elastic range, however much you uh, strain it, it produces a certain amount of stress. So that the stress and the strain are linked. Uh, you know, for a certain strain, there'll be a certain stress, or for a certain stress, there'll be a certain strain. And as long as it's, well, in, in any case, but in this case, we're, we're, uh, we're in this uh, uh, linear range, so, so they're directly proportional. So for this, for this uh, stress, I can calculate what this strain is as long as I know the uh, Young's modulus. So for steel, that was, that was given at the beginning. That's a 29,000 KSI. So I can then uh, divide this number by that and end up with, with that. 
Okay, that's what this little calculation is. So that number there is the 000745. I mean, it's a small number, but it, I mean, that's, some numbers are big, some numbers are small. You can't, you can't <laughs> act like it's trivial. I mean, some people, I think you have a tendency to look at that and say, my goodness, well, that's pretty insignificant. Well, come on, it's just a, it's just, it's a very stiff material. If you uh, push it that amount, restrain it, remember this is inches per inch, an inch isn't very long either. If you compress it and, you know, if this is inches, you know, you can think of it as miles per mile if you want. Okay, what, <laughs> if, you can, if that were uh, a mile, then convert that back down to an inch and maybe it seems like more to you, <laughs> I don't know. But, but uh, at any rate, it is a, it does result in, in quite a lot of stress, as you see, that, that degree of strain. Now for the wood, you do the same thing. Wood is, is a much uh, uh, less stiff material compared to steel, so this, is the, this might be the, the uh, stress-strain curve for the wood. It also has some uh, allowable limit. In this case, it was just uh, 700 KSI. I, I mean, 700 PSI, that must be 0.7 KSI. Um, and that then also with the, uh, where was the, this is the, uh, this is interesting. Okay, this is in KSI and uh, KSI and KSI. This is in PSI here, which is more typical for wood. That's a million PSI, right? And then this is 725 PSI would be the limit for the wood. Well, when you compare those two, of course the units drop out. These are unitless. It's inches per inch or whatever. You know, it has no uh, dimension actually. Um, it's, that's why it's nice to use. Oops. Okay, so you also, get, you also get a number there. Now this one, when you calculated it, it's a little bit less. So if you, you look at them on the, the graph here, the wood uh, strain is here and the steel strain is here. The steel can take a little more strain apparently than the wood. That's not, I mean it depends on your materials which one, uh, but they're not going to be the same number in any case. One will, one will reach its limit before the other in terms of strain. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, depends on the materials. Now, so, so you have to tra treat these limits the same way that you treat, whoops, uh, these limits. You know, this is an allow, these, these are allowable limits in terms of stress, and, and we've looked at those before, like you calculate uh, MC over I, right, and it gives you a stress that gives you maybe this stress. And you say, well, it's either you know, safe or not safe. Well, you could also do a calculation in terms of strain and, and determine whether that's a safe strain or not. If you exceed the, this allowable strain, either, either of these, then, then you're going beyond, you're simultaneously exceeding uh, the stress, really. So you're going beyond the limit. So, oops, <laughs> find my little button there. So you have to determine um, which of these strains is going to um, be reached first. When I, put the, when I put the material together like this, it locks, these, it locks the material in a certain position. And when I, when I then load it and strain it, um, these, these numbers are kind of, well, they, they, are, they are locked, right? There, there's a relationship between the, the number here and here. They're, they're all linear, in fact. So um, you, have to, you, you have to find which of, the, which of the strains is reached first, and you can't exceed the, the other one, right? One of them, in other words, you max out one of them, and the other one's not going to be. In this case, I built a diagram, and you see this one turned out to be 745. I set it to 745, let's say, and then I could calculate, uh, you know, simple similar triangles here, I could calculate what the other number was. Okay, so I came out with uh, 000683. Well then I'd go back and I'd compare that 683 to what I had over here for the wood and I'd say, oh, 725, it's okay. It didn't strain, it didn't exceed it, right? But the other one is at a maximum. If I had if I had exceeded it, if it had been, uh, if, 
if, uh, say, the number I got was maybe uh, 0008, and I'd look at this and say, oh, no, that would mean I'd be failing my wood. So then I'd have to come back, come back to this diagram and, and make that the unknown value up there and, and put, in it, put the, the maximum wood value here and, and solve for that. So you can start by, you know, you assume one and solve for the other one. I mean, assume one's at its limit. Maybe you start with the steel, assume the steel's at the limit, and then calculate what the, the, the strain at the wood is. And if the wood then goes beyond its limit, mm, then you know you picked the wrong one, right? And then, you, then you'd put the, the limit in here for the wood. So in other words, one of these two numbers is going to be at its limit. I mean, think of this. What, what if you did this? You could draw a little graph like this and put them both at their limit, right? But, but you'd have to draw it accurately. And you'd find that uh, it wouldn't make a straight line, right? If you here, turn that line on a second. Um, you know, maybe you'd have the, maybe you'd have, well, it, it, in this example, if we had done that, we'd have had uh, the, uh, whatever it is, 745, oh, 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 uh, 745 here, and the other one was uh, just a little bit behind it, right? Oh, 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 seven, what the heck was it? 25? Okay, if that's right. And then I'd get, then I'd get a, a, a graph that wouldn't be linear, right? It would go like that. I'd be saying, well, if I want to make it linear, it's going to go like that, or it'll go like that. So you've got two choices for the graph. It's got to be a straight line, and it's got to go through, it's got to go through one of these two points. Either it goes through this point, or it goes through this point. And which, whichever one you choose, uh, the other dot, <laughs> the other point, has to be back on this side. So if I chose this one, wait a minute, did I do this right? Oh, oh, no, yeah, 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 you're right. Uh, hmm. this, this, this number has to be on this side. This number has to be on this side, right? Uh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm saying this, this is getting confusing. Um, this number has to be, as the allowable limit, has to cannot be exceeded. Okay, if I say it can't be exceeded, okay, so if I go up like this, this number is exceeding that number, so that wouldn't be allowed, right? If I go like, like this, then this number is not exceeding this number. So this would be safe, this would be smaller. So this is the one I actually did, I took this line. I could not take, I could not take this line because that would put this number here in excess of that number, right? So you can look at it. I mean, you can actually kind of draw it out. You can, you, you don't really have to draw it out if you just pick one, pick one and calculate the other one, and then you can see it's either over it or under it. And if it's, you know, if you get a number like this time, in this case we got 683, okay, that's un, under 725, then it was okay. Yeah, turn it back down. Anyway, so that, I mean, what it shows you is those two numbers, they, they do have to fall on this graph. The strains are, are compatible in the sense that they, they, um, they're both on the same linear uh, curve, right? They're both, they're both on this line. They have to be on that line. Now, once you, get, once you get this diagram set up and you know what these numbers are, then it's an easy step to translate it into stresses. To translate it back to stresses, all you have to do is set it, set it back through the relationship with the uh, Young's modulus. So you, you take this number here, and you say, uh, let's see, where did I do that? <laughs> Good. Well, you, you multiply that number times 29,000. Oh, here it is, down here. Uh -huh. Oh, that's, it. that's back at the other point. OK, I didn't actually do that. The, this number times 29,000 would be that number. Th those were the two that were paired, right? The, uh, the, the limit here, the allowable strain, and that allowable stress. So those two add up there. If I want to find this number, the stress at the bottom side of the plate, 
uh, might be interesting, I don't know. Then I'd take this strain multiplied by the 29,000. Okay, there's that, and that would give me that number. The stress in the wood, meanwhile, uh, that would be this strain. It's the same strain. It's at, at that point. You know, this, at this point, you've got this is the stress in the, the wood, and this is the stress in the steel at exactly the same, I mean, you know, on either side of that, that uh, joint there or that seam. Okay, so I'd take this number times, you know, that times the, the uh, um, Young's modulus for the wood. This is in PSI, so I come out with PSI then. This is PSI in the wood, KSI in the steel. This is, the, the allowable was what, 700 something, wasn't it? So the allowable for the wood was 700 and something PSI. This is, so the wood is not stressed quite to its limit, 682 PSI, that's safe. Uh, and this one is right at, well that's not the limit, but this is right at the limit, the top side of it. You can also see, I mean this is also interesting, this is exactly the same point essentially. I mean this is in the wood, at the top edge of the wood and the bottom edge of the steel. And you can see the difference there. This one's only, this is like 0.68 KSI, right? And this is 19 KSI. So the steel's doing, contributing quite a bit more uh, capacity to the beam than the wood is. Uh, the steel's doing a lot of work there. Uh, well, so the wood is kind of a placeholder. <laughs> it's not doing that much. Anyway, okay. so. Now you want to, the, the next step would be to, to go ahead and, and uh, calculate the moment based on that. So you've got the stresses, right? This is the, uh, the transform section and you've got to scale it back by, you know, when the steel was what was scaled, so you've got to put that in factor in there. Uh, this is the distance to the top of the steel, I suppose, from the centroid up to the, uh, from the neutral axis up to the top of the, the beam. It was a six inch beam. So there's half of that. So you end up with um, that 116 kip inches. That you'd probably want to <coughs> eventually convert into kip feet and then back calculate on into um, a load on a beam. You know, like you'd say WL squared over 8 is equal to this maybe and then calculate your W to get the load. Uh, interestingly enough, you could do it with either one of these and get exactly the same capacity because they are, they are linear. I mean, it, it doesn't matter, uh, I mean, if you're actually looking at, we, we've calculated the stress at, at different points along the depth, but they're, they're all part of the same behavior. And, and whether I choose the wood, at the depth of the wood to do my calculation or the depth of the steel, I end up with the same moment. Uh, so I could do it with the wood. You see, uh, this is the, the stress in the wood at this depth, right? This is the, the top edge of the wood. This is that calculated stress in the wood. This is the same, the same as that. It's the same section, and you come out with the same number, right? It, which, if, if you think about it, it would have to be. It's because, um, it's all the same beam. It's the same beam, and it's at the same place in the, in the beam, and you're just doing different calculations uh, through the depth, uh, but you're using both these numbers together. So, I mean, it kind of scales out to the same. Um, you could do this same thing uh, without doing, of course, it's not quite as fun, but without going through the uh, building the strain diagrams, you could just uh, plug in the allowable stresses to this. Rather, see, we went through and found the allowable strains, and then we found which strain controlled. You could just from the outset, rather than look at the strains at all, you could plug the allowable stresses into this equation, right? You still have to trans calculate the transform moment of inertia, but now, now you don't know which one's controlling. So you have to, here you have to work both equations. Uh, because only one of these is valid. You don't, in this case, we got the correct numbers. These are the correct numbers in both of them because we calculated this number, right? 
But here we didn't calculate this number. We just took, you could take the maximum allowable and put it in there, and you put the, the maximum allowable in here, and then you calculate both equations, and then you have to look at, and here you determine which one is actually controlling. So one of them will be a little bit lower than their lower than the other one, you have to take the lower one because that means it's, it's just like, like, like this point here. We couldn't take this point, we had to take the, the, the lower graph, right? We could, you can't take, you know, this bottom one's representing this graph and this top one's representing this graph. So you have to go with the, the where both of them are going to be safe. In, in this case, the, the wood would be safe, but the steel would fail. In this case, the steel is safe and the wood is, is not quite at its full capacity. So this, here the steel would be beyond its full capacity. And beyond its full capacity means it would be overstressed. If you brought the wood, if you brought the wood to that uh, degree of, of load, to that moment, the steel would already have, have passed its allowable limit. And I mean, if you go far enough, the steel will actually bend and then you've, then that's not a happy beam. You've got problems. So anyway, let's see. So that's a capacity example. So now you, we looked at first two, that's a second analysis. The first analysis was what, from Monday was um, pass fail. This one, you, we actually looked at capacity. And now this example is, is a design example. Here, here the question is, Say I have some given loading um, and maybe a, a configuration for a beam, but I don't have any of the dimensions. How big do I need to make the beam? So this is, this is then design. You're, you're building something, you've got the load on it, and you want to know, okay, how big do I need to make this beam so it's going to be safe? Well, you could always, I mean, we, we did know that that first example determined whether it passed or failed, right? So you could, one approach, is you could always just guess, guess the size. You know, maybe you've got a couple pieces of wood and you've got a piece of steel, I don't know. And you say, well, maybe this will work. And you could, you could guess it and then analyze it, just do the analysis and see whether it passes or fails. The only problem with that is, well, you might be wrong. <laughs> it might fail. And if it fails, then you've got to, well, then what are you going to do, guess again? I mean, you could, spend, you could spend quite a while just guessing and analyze it and and it might fail again. So the, the advantage for a, a design procedure, the idea is you pick it uh, directly, that you solve for it uh, without too much guesswork. Uh, and this is a uh, pretty straightforward procedure. Uh, let's see, we'll go through these. Determine the required moment. Okay, so you start, you're, you're given the loads, so you have to uh, find the, the the moment that's on it, you probably look at the capacity of, of uh, one of the materials. Say, if, if you're doing this with, as a flitched beam, this is a flitched beam. Uh, a pretty, uh, I don't know, well, I, I was going to say common, but it's not that common. But there, it, it's a common configuration for uh, composite um, wooden steel or wooden, you know, composite material as opposed to the, the last example with the steel on top, that's probably, I don't know how you'd make that. But this, this, this is fairly easy to construct, and actually it's a, uh, is a useful way either to reinforce a, an existing beam, to bring it up, you know, a lot of times in a renovation project, you, maybe you're taking out a wall and suddenly your beam goes from a 12-foot span to a 20-foot span, and it's not strong enough anymore. Well, you could rip out the whole beam and put in a whole new beam, which might be a little bit of trouble, or you could beef it up, so to speak, and you might do that by uh, either scab plates on the outside or, or creating a flitch beam. Or there might be other scenarios. At any rate, they're stronger than, than uh, the wood alone. Uh, often, you'll have, uh, in terms of design, you might pick, um, say, the wood. You know, say, I'm going to go with two two by twelves because they're basically the biggest piece that you're going to have in terms of the wood. And if I use two two by twelves, how much steel will I have to, to have in the center? So that's kind of this scenario. It's, it's uh, assume a certain size wood and then determine how much steel you need to make up your capacity. 
And if it looks like too much steel, well, you could always add more wood, or you know, you could play around with a little. But you do have two two variables to play with: the wood and the steel. So this 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 looks at the first that uh, assumes a capacity, assumes a size for the wood, uh, and find the capacity of that. Then it looks at how much is left that the steel has to carry. Then you um, let's see, find the largest uh, allowable uh, strain for the uh, steel based on the dimensions, I guess. Calculate the required uh, section modulus for the steel plate. Okay, and then you have to find the width of the steel plate. So you, you find first how ge the geometric section modulus, and then that has the section modulus has B and D in it. So you have to, there you, again, you have two variables. You have to pick one and solve for the other one. So you might pick the the depth, since it kind of goes with the beam, you might pick it based on the strain, I think is what this example does, and then calculate, solve for the width. So the design in all this ends up being the, you're designing for the width of the steel. Because you, if you pick the wood, then that kind of limits the height of the, the, uh, that the steel can possibly be, and the, the only variable left is the width of that steel plate, so the thickness of the steel that you're going to put in here. Which makes sense. I mean, even if you're doing these scab plates on the outside, in the end, it, it amounts to how thick do the plates have to be, and that's that's what you're that's what you're calculating. All right. Well, let's see if we can do this. Uh, this is an example. I think it's out of the book, actually. Um, an interesting one because it has cantilevers, and if you do the moment diagram for you, this is the load diagram, shear diagram. Here's the moment diagram. The, the center moment, and this is for this kind of construction, you deliberately try to, you can either balance these moments or you can keep this one rather low or something like that. In this case, we've got a pretty high peak moment over the reactions, and the center moment out here is really not very high. So if you design the whole thing for this moment, uh, then it would be pretty much over designed in this range, right? You'd be having it you know, a capacity of 36 KSI you really don't need. So the other advantage of these flitched beams, and particularly if you put the plates on the outside, is they don't have to be continuous. You could have a plate for this area and leave the plate out in here and have a plate, just, just two plates. It doesn't have to be a whole plate, which lightens the thing quite a bit, too, if the steel's uh, probably weighs more in the wood. Okay, so there you got the... The, the load diagrams, shear moment diagrams, um, you want to look at the capacity for the wood. You're going to assume that the wood's at full capacity. So these are the, these are two by 12s in, a, in, in our textbook, we'll assume they're full dimensions. Actually, a two by 12 might be like one and a half by 11 and a quarter or something. But just to make the problem a little easier, we'll take these dimensions, two by 12. So there's two and 12. Uh, to get the section modulus BD squared over 6, that gives you 48 inches cubed. 48, they're actually two, of, that'd be for one of them, they're actually two of them, so you've got a, a total um, section modulus for wood, for both pieces of wood, of 96. It just doubles. It's as if you doubled the, if you put four in there, you'd get 96. So, all right, if I've got 96, then I put 96 in here, and the allowable uh, flexure stress for the wood, and I can calculate the moment capacity for the wood. So this is the wood, how much the wood can carry. And that comes down to 12 uh, kip feet. It comes out first here, these are all in inches, KSI, inches cubed, so that's in uh, kip inches, and then you convert that divided by 12, and you get kip feet. Okay, now look up here. You wanna plot that on here. This is the capacity of the wood. The wood can carry, if this diagram didn't go way down here, uh, you wouldn't need the steel at all. Uh, the wood is also carrying up to a plus 12 uh, kip feet, right? So this, it easily carries the 7.2. You don't need any steel in here at all because the wood is going to carry 12, and 7 is less than 12, so you're okay. The only place that you need extra capacity where the wood, the wood is going to fail right in here. This, it's not going to carry this moment, certainly not up to 36. It, uh, it's more than double it, right? It's, it's got 12, that's triple it. 
Um, so how much does the steel have to carry then? Well, it's this difference. It's 36 minus 12. So this is the steel is going to have to make up the difference. It'll have to carry 24. So there's the, that's the, that's the load that the, the steel's got to carry. So you want a plate, you want a steel plate that carries 24 kip feet. Now, you've got to um, remember that you can't exceed that if we're assuming that the wood is at full capacity, then uh, you have to be careful that the, the steel has to follow the same strain in the wood because they're going to be bolted together. So here's the, this is a strain compatibility diagram. This is, this is the uh, figuring this, the allowable, this is at the limit of the wood. The, that uh, allowable strain. So this is the full depth of the wood, right? Or the, of the beam, right? This is the uh, edge of the wood up here. So we can put that number there. Then we look at what's the, this is the limit uh, stress for the steel. Hmm, must be kind of weak steel. That's not very high, is it? 18, okay. So you got some kind of trashy steel somehow. Maybe this is aluminum. No, it is steel, isn't it? Okay, well, not very high. At any rate, uh, you put that in there, um, and you get a limiting uh, strain for the steel. Now, you look at these two numbers, and you say, well, this is below this one, so it's going to have to come out uh, below it in the diagram. If it had been bigger, then it would have been up here somewhere, and that would have told you one of two things. Either you can make the steel plate exactly the depth of the wood, and everything's okay, or if you wanted to, you could make the steel even deeper than the wood, which would be really strange when you think about that. that then this thing's it's like a hot dog with the bun too long. The thing's sticking out the end. Uh, it's just not very aesthetic. I don't know why you'd want to do that. Yeah, come on. You've got, you got to have some degree of, of propriety in this sort of thing. You can't just have steel sticking out of wood flitch beams. Anyway, um, but th it, this one works out rather nicely, so this is going to be uh, below it. At any rate, you can't, you can't bring the steel up to the edge. You could bring, actually, you could, and it probably m might even be more efficient, you could bring the steel all the way up to the, the height of the wood, but what would happen? You couldn't assume the capacity, the full capacity of the wood anymore. Then you'd have to go back and decrease that 12 uh, uh, KSI capacity of the wood because the wood would have to drop. I mean, if you brought, well, yeah, yeah, you could bring the steel all the way up here, but it would still have to be at point 0.6. You'd have to redraw the diagram like, like that, right? You'd have to, you couldn't go higher than uh, this 006, and the wood would have to be at 006, and then you'd have to recalculate the wood, the stress in the wood. Anyway, but we'll go this way. We'll assume the wood stays that way, and the steel's going to be a little bit uh, less uh, deep. Okay, now, so we know the depth of the, did I skip a slide? No. Oh, no. No, here we go. Okay, this is, this is the uh, uh, capacity that the steel is going to have to carry, the required capacity. This is its stress. It's going to be stressed all the way to the limit. We already figured that out. Uh, this is then the required section modulus for that wood. The M over F gives us 16. This is in, in inches, and this is inches. So we can get the section modulus for the steel. Now, given that section modulus, that's BD um, squared over 6. We can assume one of these two and calculate the other one. Well, actually, we've already determined the depth, right? We said the depth was, because we, we already figured the depth on the other, didn't we? Yeah, here's the depth. We already limited the depth based on the strain. So we cannot exceed. We can't use 5 inches. We've got to go, maybe we could use four and three quarters, that would be nice, but 4.8 is kind of the limit. And that gives a total depth, right? It's double that, because this is just half. So the, the, the full plate is six, uh, 9.6. So, so you stuff 9.6 in here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Uh, and solve for, you've just rearranged this equation and solve for B. Solving for B, that comes out to, whoa, man, what a hunk of steel, huh? That's no, no. Maybe they, sh maybe they should cut it in half and put it on the outside. That would be at least a half an, an inch. That's going to be one heck of a plate. I don't know where this example came from. but OK. So 1.042 inches. Well, see, you're not going to be able to go down and buy a 1.042 inch 
plate probably, you're going to have to round off to whatever inch or an uh, eighth or a sixteenth or something like that, whatever is available. So this would be okay. You could go, you know, keep the same depth, 9.6, obviously, and make it thicker. That's going to be safe. Or if you go thinner, then you're going to have to, um, what, well, I mean, it's so close. Come on, it'd probably be okay anyway. You wouldn't, wouldn't worry with it. What did I do here? Oh, no, this is why I did. I said that was okay. An inch is a little less than that, actually. But I guess that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's approximately okay. Come on. Can't be too fussy. And, and if you wanted to go an inch and an eighth, then you could round this down. See, so eventually you've got to balance these numbers so you get some sort of plate that you can go conveniently purchase. So that one's also safe, I suppose, although it's really enormously thick. Okay, so now we know the plate size. The only thing left is to determine how, how long the plate has to be because the, the, the beauty of this was we didn't have to buy a plate that was the whole length. I mean, if you're going to have to, <laughs> this, this thing's an inch thick. You certainly don't want it to be, however, what is this, 24, uh, 36, 36. Somebody should calculate how heavy that is. Can you do that? Calculate how heavy that would be? That'd be interesting to know, wouldn't it? 30, it's 36 feet, find the volume of it, 30, 36 feet converted to... Oh, no, no, you better, I don't know what it is in inches, though. It's, steel is like uh, 400 or 500 pounds per cubic foot. 400 pounds. 400 pounds? Who knows? How, weighs, how much does steel weigh? Come on. <laughs> Who's got a laptop over? You can Google this for me. <laughs> It's 400 pounds per cubic foot. Assume that. 400 pounds per cubic foot and divide it by 1728 and you can get cubic inches and then see how many, what the volume is in cubic inches. Well, okay, so why, while uh, Matthew pursues that very interesting piece of information, it's going to be heavy. And it would be better, it would certainly be lighter if it were only eight feet long. That's going to take a couple of people to lift anyway. At least four, I don't think. Anyway, um, maybe they do it before lunch. You can lift more before lunch. So you've got to figure out how long this is. And, and that is based on, on uh, the, assumpt the fact that it follows this, this distance right here. This is the amount that the steel carries. So on the moment diagram, from 12 to 12, 12 to 12, these are symmetric. So you've got to find where, what these values are. Oh, my goodness. And this is probably what that does. And seeing that it's in uh, a proportion like that, it's, it's probably fine. This is a straight line, so that's a little bit easier. You can say uh, this distance is proportional to, oh, golly, uh, the smaller triangle. That's this distance here. So here's a triangle, and here's a big triangle. So 36 is to 6 as x1 is to 24. That must be that proportion there. Or you could have done it. I don't know. That seems a little awkward. This right here is at um, this square would be 24, right? Coming across from here to here, this, this change is 24. So if I looked at a square that was 24 and the depth is 6, the width must be, I mean, a rectangle. The area is 24. The depth is 6. The width must be 4. So that would be, that would be four. Yeah, it is. Look at that. It's four. So that one's not too hard. This one must be, ooh, this one's harder because it's on a parabolic line. I wouldn't even, you could write some sort of screwy parabolic equation here, but I don't think I'd do that. I think I'd go up, up to where it's easier. You follow this line up and calculate it on, on this diagram. And if you could get the dimensions of this triangle, then you'd have that base. So that's probably what I did. Oh, look, I think like myself. This is, this distance x3 is actually, this is this diagram here. And if you take the 43 minus 24, that's the, the 24 is this part of it from 36 up to 12. So here's 24 in here. And this is what's left is 19.2. So that's the area. And, and taking that area and setting it equal to the, the area formula, BD over uh, 2, that's the area of that triangle. Then, then for B, you, you substitute in 
um, x sub 3. <laughs> and then you have to calculate this in terms of x3, which would be the slope times the base, right? There's the slope, I guess, right? Here, rise over run, right? Rise over run. So there's the slope times, times uh, that portion, and that gives you that, right? So then you, those, that's b and d over 2, and then you can solve for, oh, it still comes out squared. You got to multiply them together. Squared, 64. Oh, but that's nice. The uh, square root of 64 is 8. And, but that's that portion. That was then that, not this. So then you've got to subtract 8 from 12. Wow, it hardly seems worth it. Maybe you could just draw it accurately and measure it. <laughs> I don't know. I'd want to do all that work. Not, not twice. Well, I guess. Oh, come on. It's not that much work. It's fun. OK, so at least that, that adds up to 8. And what is the weight? Holy, well, for the whole thing, the the, for the full thing, 1,300 pounds, that, that weighs a lot. So you don't want 1,300 pounds if you, now you divide it by, and half. No, 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 it's 8, 8, not uh, 36. You'd have to divide it, divide it, divide it by 836, whatever that is, right? No, no, no. Multiply it by 8, Multiply divide it by 36. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, well, and the number would be less than a thousand, whatever it is, 500 pounds. Five, yeah, see, it would take five people with a steel head. How much? 288. 288. Two, oh, a mere 288. Easily lifted by two, two uh, guys that have had their Wheaties. Right. Oh, no, I'm not done with this. Holy smokes, I got a minute. I got, I, it took me two weeks to get these slides. I got to show you these. Here are living examples. Look at this. And this guy, I found this picture on the internet. Can you believe this guy's name? He's, <laughs> <laughs> he's no relation to me at all. I wrote him and I said, who the heck are you? What are you doing with my name? <laughs> but he's not quite, he's not a fun guru. Anyway. Um, so if you look in here, this is a case, this was an old house, and he did a renovation, and, and exactly that scenario, cut out a wall or something, and had a longer beam, so they had to beef this up a little bit, and they didn't want to do it, they didn't want a deeper section, because a deeper section you would have hit your head on or something, I know, it looked ugly if you were putting the floor uh, ceiling across there. So you can see the steel in here, this was probably the original beam, and he added steel and then wood on the other side of it to beef it up to make it strong enough. He must have cut these short and, and put them in with nice, shiny new plates there, hangers. OK, so that's one example. And then there's another one I found also on the web of the other side. Here's one where they've got the, the uh, uh, scab plates. I think the word flitch actually means sandwiched together. So a flitched beam and people are kind of loose with the terminology anyway. I think a flitch beam is the wood's on the outside and the steel is sandwiched between the wood. So they could, you could call this a flitch beam, but I think it's probably got some other name like a scab beam or something. I don't know what it's called. But this is one where they uh, actually, I think part of it was being able to lift it through. They built it in pieces. That's not bolted together yet. And I don't know if they actually did this. There they knocked a hole in the wall and, and slung the thing through the attic. So it was, I think, pretty much manhandled into place. And there's an advantage then, really, if you're doing this without, there's no way to get a crane in there, not, you could do it not bolted together. In other words, you could move one plate in there, then you could move the wood in there, then you could move the other plate in there, then you could tip it all up together and bolt it together, and you'd have a beam that would be fairly strong without, uh, getting in I mean how are you going to get inside there with a crane it's got a roof on it for heaven's sakes you'd have to knock a hole in the roof and not a good idea okay so there you got it the short and long of flitch beams